Wisdom, the final frontier to true knowledge. Welcome to Wisdom Trek, where our mission is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Hello, my friend. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, your captain on our journey to increase wisdom and create a living legacy. Thank you for joining us today as we explore wisdom on our second millennium of podcast. This is day 1,371 of our trek, and it is Worldview Wednesday. Creating a biblical worldview is essential in order to have a proper perspective on today's current events. To establish a biblical worldview, you must have a proper understanding of God and His Word. Our focus for the next several months on Worldview Wednesday is mastering the Bible through a series of brief insights. These insights are extracted from a book by the same title from one of today's most prominent Hebrew scholars, Dr. Michael S. Heiser. This book is a collection of insights designed to help you to understand the Bible better. When we let the Bible be what it is, we can understand it as the original readers did and as the original writers intended. Each week we will explore two additional insights. Today's insights will cover Mastering the Bible, Biblical Agendas, and Translations. So let's start with insight number 57, which is, each gospel writer had his own agenda. There are four gospels for a reason. Their existence isn't an accident. The fact that more than one was written suggests that each writer had a slightly different audience in mind. Examining their content validates this hunch. Unlike other gospels, the Gospel of Matthew nowhere states a specific purpose or occasion for Matthew's enterprise. Determining Matthew's audience and objective can only be accomplished by careful reading. Matthew references the Old Testament more than any other gospel, with special interest in Messianic themes such as establishing that Jesus was the Son of David and how his life fulfilled Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. Matthew uses distinctive phrases of Jewish literature such as Father in Heaven more than the other gospels. He includes Jewish customs and terms without explaining them to the readers, and this is especially compared to the Gospel of Mark. All of these things and others indicate that Matthew was written to a Jewish audience to convince them that Jesus was the Messiah. One of the unusual things scholars have noticed about Mark's Gospel is the frequent use 42 times of the Greek verb euthis, often translated immediately. Mark consistently presented Jesus as a man of action, getting things done with expediency. Mark completely omits Jesus' birth and childhood, and there is no genealogy. These things don't matter to Mark's audience. He writes to people more concerned about what Jesus does than who he is, which is different from Matthew. These features make Mark's account conform to Roman cultural values. This is especially important because of the way Jesus died as a criminal by the heinous method of crucifixion. Mark needs to explain why the crucifixion happened to his audience, so he blends the description of the man they can admire with the defense of the gospel. Now as we move on to Luke, he tells us from the outset that he is writing to a Greek friend called Theophilus. Luke, Lucas, is a Greek name. Luke uses Greek terms not found in the other gospels. He seeks to reach a Hellenized world, not Jews or Romans. He seeks to reach a Hellenized world, not Jews or Romans, with the gospel of Jesus. His strategy is a lengthy letter, his gospel, to Theophilus, that he might have certainty concerning what he heard about Jesus. And lastly, we come to John, the gospel with the most unique material. John's agenda is nevertheless transparent. His gospel presents the most concerted effort of presenting the deity of Jesus Christ. Only in John do we get the seven I am statements of Jesus, a phrase hearkening back to the name of God given at the burning bush. John includes unique statements uttered by Jesus, such as, The Father and I are one, in John 10.30. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, John chapter 14, verse 9. Then you will know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father, John 10, verse 38. And John tells us why. He wrote his gospel so that the readers understood in John chapter 20, verse 31, But these are written that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. Next, let's move on to insight number 58. The New Testament writers used Bible translations for their work. The Bible of Jesus and the Apostles was the Old Testament. 
The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew, a language of the ancient Israelites and Jews. Jesus and his disciples probably had some knowledge of Hebrew, but the common language in Judea during the first century was Aramaic. The Hebrew Bible had been translated into Aramaic by Jesus' day. Consequently, the odds are high that Jesus and the Twelve would have preached from the Bible in Aramaic, a translation. Despite the fact that Aramaic Bibles were commonplace and Jews in the Holy Land spoke Aramaic, the New Testament wasn't originally written in Aramaic. Instead, it was written in Greek. The reason was that Judea wasn't the whole world. Aramaic may have been a common tongue in Judea, but the rest of the world spoke primarily Greek. Fortunately, the Hebrew Old Testament had been translated into Greek a couple centuries before Jesus was born. The Greek translation was called the Septuagint. Since the New Testament writers could communicate with the entire world in Greek, the New Testament was written in that language. So for the most part, the Septuagint was used to quote the Old Testament. There was a Greek orientation to both Testaments in the earliest days of the church. Considering this, the Septuagint and the New Testament combined served to be the Bible of the earliest Christians. This has ramifications when it comes to reading and understanding the New Testament. For one thing, the Septuagint says things that the Hebrew Old Testament, referred to as the Masoretic Text now, does not. The New Testament used the Old Testament verses for articulating theological points of time makes use of these differences. When that is the case, most modern study Bibles indicate that in footnotes. Sometimes the differences derive from the translation techniques. In other instances, such as in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verses 8 and 9 and verse 43, the difference comes from the fact that the Hebrew text used to produce the Septuagint derived from what we now regard as the traditional Hebrew or Masoretic text. Knowing this can resolve apparent contradictions and explain what the New Testament writers saw in a particular Old Testament verse that might seem a bit obscure to us now. The fact that Jesus, the disciples, the New Testament writers, and the earliest Christians used translations ought to encourage us today. If Jesus, Matthew, John, and Paul, for example, can trust translations to be God's Word, so can we. Fortunately, we have thousands of manuscripts in the original languages of the Bible that scholars can reference to validate or improve translations, not only for English translations, but for translations and languages used around the world. Bible translation is never perfect since no translator is omniscient, but it is light years from a haphazard, imprecise discipline. And this can give us comfort that we know that we have the Word of God, just like Jesus and the disciples did. That will conclude this week's lesson from another two insights from Dr. Heiser's book, Mastering the Bible. Next Worldview Wednesday, we will continue with two additional insights. I believe that you'll find on these Worldview Wednesday interesting topics to consider as we build our biblical worldview. Tomorrow, we will continue with our three-minute humor nugget that will provide you with a bit of cheer, which will help you to lighten up and live a rich and satisfying life. So encourage your friends and family to join us and to come along with us tomorrow for another day of Wisdom Trek, Creating a Legacy. If you'd like to listen to any of the past 1,370 treks or read the Wisdom Journal, they are all available at wisdom-trek.com. And I encourage you to subscribe to Wisdom Trek on your favorite podcast player so that each day's trek will be downloaded to you automatically. And thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor. But most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously. Lead with integrity, and then leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you tomorrow.